All right. It's time for Raj. The idea that the organization defines the premise of market behavior is theoretical at best and archaic for sure. Today, we as customers are in the driving seat and businesses who are not organized to keep up with that, they are very quickly deemed irrelevant. We as customers, we compare all the experiences we've ever had to one another and it's always the best ones that wins. So that makes it really, really hard for, let's say, a small enterprise needing some e-commerce uh, solutions to create an Amazon-esque experience. The oxymoron is that we as consumers, we consistently want more elegance, more simplicity, more accessibility, while we as businesses, we just compile and add complexity to our service every single day. And sometimes that makes us as a business our own worst enemy. Raj is here to talk about how businesses can change this by, by making business architecture more dynamic and more continuous. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. <coughs> is that okay? Thank you very much, Google, for that uh, fantastic introduction. I think I need somebody like her for my marketing because I, <laughs> I do a lousy job myself. So we're going to talk about <coughs> simplicity, speed, and scalability. One third of this audience in five years' time will have a fantastic job. You guys will be at the core of organizational change. Whatever comes your way, you will be the one who determines your organization or any of your consultant other organizations, and you will be the most critical part of the future. The other one third of you will have your jobs impacted by technology, by things, uh, by the consumer, by the customer, and so soon you'll find yourself quickly adapting to those changes. And then there's the last one-third. The last one-third, either if you had a lot of money saved up, maybe we'll, you'll take your millions and retire to the French, French Riviera, or you will be so frustrated in your job, you'll be fighting your job. Yesterday was all about how businesses are organized. Most of the themes were about how businesses are organized and how a hierarchical versus centralized control, decentralized. Today, I'm going to focus, at least in my talk, I'm going to focus on you as an individual. How do you move from if, how do you move up to the, to the one third that is dynamic and uh, uh, you're a central part of the organization, okay? So it's all about change. We know change is in everywhere. Change is going to happen. My wife and I have been married for 25 years. In fact, we celebrated uh, our 25th wedding anniversary to each other last two weeks back. Both of us have coffee with cream. I come down. I have the coffee first. So I, I set up the coffee, and then I put cream and sugar. And then I stir the uh, cream and sugar with the, co the coffee with a spoon, put the spoon down on the counter. Now this, apparently, is so frustrating for her because it leaves a stain on the counter. And I've never been able to change. This is, this is the way I do it, right? So she says, change, change, change. So finally, after this 25 years, I said, OK, maybe I'll start the change. So what I did was I took, that, uh, I took my spoon, rinsed it, and put it in the sink. So she comes down, and she says, where's the spoon? <laughs> I say, well, I'm, I'm changing. I put it in the sink. And she says, no, that's not what you should do. Because now, first I was wasting a paper towel trying to wipe that stain off. Now you put that spoon in the sink. Now I have to pick up another spoon to wash and to use, and that's, we're going to have to wash two spoons instead of one. That is not good. So I said, what, do you, what did you want me to do? Well, you have to rinse the spoon first, and then you have to take a new cup, 
put that spoon in the cup so that when I come down, I'll be ready to use that, right? So that's, <clears throat> that's change. And I just got, after 25 years, I just got used to what she wanted. And suddenly, management changed its mind, or her mind. <laughs> so, so change is very difficult, let me tell you that. <clears throat> um, so I want to set the context. People said, you got to have a lot of color in your video. I mean, in your uh, presentation. This is, I put all my color in this one slide. <laughs> so this is what you're going to get. And what I decided was, there's a lot of stuff that I want to share. So I said, let me play a video that gives you the context of everything. And then once you've watched that video, then we can have discussions about uh, some topics that I wanted to share, okay? The imperative for simplicity, speed, and scalability. Hello, 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 everybody. It's great and wonderful to be here at Prague, especially at this conference where I get to meet wonderful people like you. Every day, you and I interact with the world, from the likes of toasters, dishwashers, and light switches, who listen to our every command, to friends who empathize with you, your cable company rep who doesn't really care what you have to say, to your teenage kids who think you know nothing. Some of these interactions, like the ones you have with the cable company, you want to make them as simple as possible so you can spend more time justifying your existence to your kids. Dealing with your cable company can be a pain. Try canceling your subscription. So you call the 1-800 number and you're taking through a maze of options. After you punch in the numbers, two, four, seven, three, six, three, one, five, four, blah, 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 eight, three, you finally get to a place where you have to. Then you're on hold for about 13 minutes. You wait patiently as you eat your sandwich. You just took a bite when the guy on the other end says, hi, my name is Zeus, how can I help you? You've just taken a mouthful of the sandwich and you can't speak for about four seconds. So you're still swallowing it, almost getting choked in the process. And Zeus on the other hand thinks that though there's nobody online and so he hangs up. But you are persistent. You go through the process again. This time waiting with more focus and no sandwich. You finally get Shiva. He listens with concern on your needs to cancel your subscription. After taking all the information about you, your address, the best number to call you back, your email ID, your mother's maiden name, your son's third grade the teacher's husband's boss's name, Shiva tells you that really he can't help you, but he'll help to transfer you to another cancellation specialist. As he asks you to be on hold and you hear silence for a while. After about seven minutes of silence, you really don't know if you got dropped or you're still connected. And so on it goes. Do you see anything simple with that interaction? The good news is that in this day and age, even with all the technologies around us, like the internet, the machine learning, internet of things, cloud, blockchain, and big data, we still need people like us to think through and fix things really design simple and scalable experiences. Instead, think about this experience. You sign onto your cable company's website, click on the cancel subscription button, state a reason, and be done with it. Do you know why that's not possible? Simplifying is not simple. Adding complexity is simple, but simplifying is not. Adding complexity is simple because all you have to do is add on to whatever is existing. To simplify stuff, you have to actually reach out into the bowels of the organization and rip and reconfigure, changing processes and attitudes and political fiefdoms. Today, business environments have become more competitive. So in addition to simplicity, your business wants speed and scale as well. So now what do you do? Well, Two things can help. 
architecture for scale and technology for speed. So in simple terms, architecture is about understanding how your organization works now and it should work in the future. We do this by creating models of the current state and models of the future state and figure out how the transformation is going to happen. So can you delete this one step in the process? What's going to happen? Can you outsource this capability? How much will that cost? What are you going to do with the people supporting that capability right now? Here are some things to consider as you design an architect for the future. Culture is critical. As Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Borders had a great culture where employees actually took a lot of pride in their work. Then Kmart acquired them in 1992 and wanted them to sell clothes and jewelry and toys. Kmart's strategy did not stand a chance against that kind of culture. Business models. Blockbuster lost to Netflix because Netflix came up with a different distribution system and could stock a lot more movies. Product. Blackberry had a great product, but they refused to accept that people can live without keyboards. So Apple came over and took over the mobile phone market, creating a completely new ecosystem. Reluctance to change. The digital camera was actually invented by Kodak, but they didn't want to market it because they thought it'll cannibalize their own business. Digital took over the world and Kodak filed for bankruptcy. Illegal stuff. Napster, the music sharing site, had to shut down because of illegal downloads. Spotify learned a lot of lessons from that and they went on to become pretty successful. Now we have a different problem. Companies are built on standardization for operational efficiencies, but customers, on the other hand, want personalized experiences. In Henry Ford's time, you could go to a Ford dealer and buy a car of any color, as long as it was black. Today, customers of Netflix want to watch movies that are personalized to their tastes. In the beginning of the internet, there's no personalization. Everybody got the same information on the web page. Slowly, we moved to templates where some blanks were filled in at the right spots, like your name and other personal details, so it appears like personalization. In the next phase, we moved to a concept like customers like you personalization, where we were able to identify segments of customers who behave just like you and offer things to this group that they would like. Then we moved on to loyalty cards, where the customer swipes their cards so that the company can get an idea of their buying patterns and offer products in response to that. When mobile phones became common, we used location and other real-time data to offer personalized ads to customers to entice them to shop at a local store or eat at a local restaurant. Finally, we came to the point of using face recognition to unlock phones and are at the cusp of using machine learning and AI for a richer personalization. Netflix, for example, looks at millions of customers, hundreds of thousands of movies and shows, and tries to match up customers with what they would like to watch. This cannot be done manually. So for speed, with the right architecture, technology is your friend. So there you have it. For simplicity, we have design. For scale, we have architecture. And for speed, we have technology. So these are the topics that we're going to cover in this keynote. Thanks for listening to this intro. Now let's dive in. Okay. Thank you, but I was just starting. <laughs> So the point of that was I needed to give you enough background so that you understand the context that I'm um, talking about. I chose an insurance company as an example to walk through because for two reasons. One is it's the most boring com uh, set of, it's the most boring category. Secondly, if I could convince you that insurance companies are going through such a change, which are archaic and old, 
most likely your own companies, the clients that you work for, is probably going to go through some change. So change is happening. And I'll explain a little bit about this uh, picture here. This is an insurance company w which sells auto, home, and life insurance. It sells it through the channels. Agent is the channel in this particular case. Here is a, a mobile channel. And inside the company, we have leadership. Of course, we have culture. We have branding, governance, decisions we have to make, priorities, organization, systems, blah, 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 right? These are the things that Milan was trying to, is trying to do um, as part of the symbols that represent enterprise design as well. I just uh, casually drew them as pictures. Okay. And then you have the external entities. And how an insurance uh, company makes money is this. Charges premiums, so that's income. Makes, makes investments, that's growth. And then has to pay the claims and, and operational costs. So basically what's left is profits. This is the context of what we're going to talk about, okay? So in the, in the video I showed you, design architect, well, <clears throat> we were talking about simplicity, scalability, and speed. And uh, my contention is you can pro provide those. Simplicity can be done by design, scalability by architecture, and automation, uh, speed by automation. And in automation, I particularly choose AI, um, which I'll come to later. And, and this operates in the context of a business model. You might have all these, but if you had the wrong business model, it won't work. For example, instead of selling cars today, if you were to sell horse carriages, which, which great design, great architecture behind the scenes, and some uh, you know, automated assembly line, if you're selling the wrong product for the wrong audience, it won't work, right? So that's critical as well. <clears throat> so what is design? I'm going to go through one of each circle by circle through this uh, talk. What is design? The CEO of Pepsi says that design is something that you embed in your product that romances the consumer and draws them to the shelf. She, of course, was talking about uh, a physical product that's on the shelf. And if you extend this notion, I want to keep this very simple. So design is about creating that human experience around a product or a service. Now, another example of design. Now, this is the famous red button. <coughs> if, you had, if you were to design something like shutting down a nuclear reactor, let's say you are in charge of a nuclear reactor and you have to shut it down, you want a red button. Because once you design this red button, you say, okay, in case of emergency, hit this. I, I found out that when a nuclear um, plant is shut down, the acronym for that shutting down is called, it's not scrum, but scram. It's ironic that it's called scram. Apparently, safety rods mechanism or something like that. So, but what happens is your design, as a designer, you just design the button. But what happens after you press the button is as important because design is sometimes easy. You could do the design, but the architecture doesn't happen. Remember in that video? So you have, somebody has to, you have to work with architects to figure out how that is, what's going to happen. Then you have to work with technologists to figure out what technology is, uh, is enabling you to push that red button to be effective. I also hear that the... Uh, President of the United States walks around and he has, a, when he walks around, he has a security detail who carries a bag, which is apparently called the nuclear, uh, nuclear football. And it has a, for all intents and purposes, a red button. But you want to be careful when you design that red button because you don't want to make it easy for somebody to push that red button, especially given who's in the Oval Office right now, right? You don't want to have that red button triggered by a tweet. That could put us all in trouble. So when you design a red button, you have to understand the intent behind the red button. What's going to happen? What are the consequences of pressing that red button? I believe again in New York City, um, the crosswalks have these stop signals where you can press the button and the light comes on so that you can walk across. All of them are disabled. The red button, the button there is just fake. It's just a placebo effect for customers. 
the traffic light system is designed so that it, it uh, identifies the traffic patterns in the cars and the frequency of cars and switches on and off by itself. You, as a pedestrian walking and trying to cross, it, it just gives you an Im, uh, impression that you are in control. So you're actually not in control. So in that case, the red button, if that was red, is basically does nothing. That's great design, though, right? You have a red button that does nothing. You don't need to talk to architects or technologists. You just cut the wires and you're done. <laughs> and then <clears throat> the last example I want to share with you is if uh, Steve Jobs had his way, the iPhone, which most of you use, would not have a power button, would not have an on-off button. Because he figured, why do you need a power button on an iPhone? If when I pick it up, it should work. When I uh, put it down, it should you know, shut off. So you, you have a range of options. You have the red button for the nuclear reactor where something happens, and you have the no button for the uh, iPhone. As designers, we have to, uh, from a designer perspective, we have to understand the intent behind the audience, to be able to, behind the purpose, to be able to figure out how to design, what to do with this red button design. I'm going to intersperse this one with a few videos. Um, this is about architecture and design. I'll, now we'll jump to architecture, so you'll get a concept of why um, these two have to exist with one another. Architecture sucks without design. I was reading about this concept called nudge that the Nobel laureate Richard Thaler talks about. It's about designing things so people are nudged to act in certain positive ways. For example, if you design a building with open spaces, glass panels, and an inviting staircase, then you may be nudging people to walk more, meet more colleagues, and collaborate more. Contrast this to just creating a collaborative space and forcing people to work there. This is like a narrow staircase, if you will. This is also called the banana principle. At one of your meetings, if you place a bowl of oranges and a bowl of bananas, the bananas will be taken first. Why? Not because the banana is any healthier than the orange, but because the banana is much more convenient to peel and consume. Why does this matter to business architects? Well, it's about making design an integral part of the architecture for a much more effective outcome. Let's talk about process modeling, a favorite of business and process architects. Two companies may have the same process for say, taking customers on a tour of their company. Here are the major steps. Customer signs up for the tour. Customers are validated. Customers are scheduled for the tour. The tour guide is assigned. On the scheduled day, the tour guide greets the group, takes them on the tour, asks them if they have any questions and finally says goodbye. The basic steps. Now let's look at it from two different experiences for the same process. I'll deliberately pick something that most consider boring, like a finance company. Customers sign in online and are assigned a date automatically. When they arrive, their IDs are checked. The tour guide, Sam, is an untrained, fresh college student because he costs only $9 an hour. The tour guide walks them through different parts of the company. The customer sees people busy at work at their computers. Sam asks the customer if they have any questions and Lisa does. She asks how much money the company handles. Sam has no clear answer, but millions, he says. Huh, says Lisa. After the tour, Sam walks them out to the reception. A few hand him some tips. He takes it, says thank you and goodbye. Here's another scenario. Customers sign in online and they choose a date and a time that's convenient for them. Three days before the tour, the tour guide, Alex, calls them not only to confirm their tour, but also to ask them some questions about why they want to go on the tour and what they are expecting. Maybe their friends went on it and maybe they just like to see money or maybe their child is interested in a career in finance. Alex makes a note of all this and tells them to bring their ID. On the day of the tour, the group assembles. Alex introduces himself and hands each person a personalized name tag with the company logo and tells them that for the day, they're going to be the guest of the company. He then leads them 
to a light refreshments bar that has drinks, snacks, and fruits. After that, the guests are taken on the tour, and Alex, who is well-versed with the history of the company, talks with passion about the different things. He has even prepped some of the employees to chit-chat about the work they do. At one point, they walk into a safe filled with $100 bills, and he asks his guests to guess how much money there is. This is what $5 million looks like, he says. And of course, we won't be able to walk out of this building even with a single $100 bill because it'll trigger all sorts of alarms, he warns. And so on it goes. See the difference? Both were processes that look same on paper, but the experiences that the second one delivers is much more richer. The first is efficient, but the second is more enticing. Architects need to focus as much on designing the experience as they do on modeling the process. So don't just sit at your desk with a modeling tool. Walk around, find out what experiences you can create for your customers. Designing the experience is an important part of architecture. Other things matter as well, which I'll probably discuss in another video. Thanks for watching and if you like this video, please consider subscribing. So that was an introduction to architecture. And uh, I'm sorry, I had to use an existing video for that one. That's why you see all the subscription part. Let's talk about architecture in detail. So you saw the same architecture in the previous uh, video, same architecture, but different design. So design makes a huge difference, right? So what is uh, essentially architecture? I'll keep it simple. Architecture is, for most part, understanding the current state. So you draw the current state, uh, creating models, and then you kind of stare at them, you look at them, you analyze them, you talk to customer, you talk to your business partners to figure out what do you want the future state to look like, and then you start making, working with the business to figure out, you know, model the future state. Then you have a plan for transformation, execute that transformation, and track how well you're doing, right? That's the essence of architecture, at least the type of architecture we're talk I'm talking about. <clears throat> Let's talk about automation. I chose uh, AI as automation, as in, uh, but this is technology in general or automation in, in any form. I chose AI for two reasons. One is that I think, as I said earlier, five years from now, AI is going to be much more perva uh, pervasive in the organization. A AI meaning artificial intelligence. It's going to be much more pervasive. And we as designers and architects have to understand the implications of AI. The second reason is just that I just have a degree in AI and it's just I know a little bit about it. Let's, what, is, what is AI? Um, I'm not going to read the second two, but look at what CEO of Google Sundar Pichai had to say. AI is more important than... <clears throat> fire or electricity. Now the implication of this is, can you go home today or to your room and turn off the electricity and use no fire and see how long you can last? So that's a huge implication. Google is becoming an AI company and, and everybody else is also talking about AI. So this is, I mean, there is a lot of fluff, but there is also a lot of reality. I'll give you an example of how Google uses AI. You can pull out your phones right now and see, check this one if you want. When I came to Prague, I said, what's interesting about Prague? And I heard that the largest castle was in Prague, the largest castle in the world. So I went to Yahoo and said, how big is the Prague castle? And Yahoo gives me this list on my left. I went to Google and tried the same search terms. It gave me that list. I actually wanted the one on the right because Google not only just took my search terms, it interpreted it for me uh, and said, here's how many square feet that um, the castle is. In the first case, it just gives you a list of uh, links where you can find the, how, big the, uh, how big the castle is, right? Huge difference. AI, when you drop AI into an organization, uh, it's going to affect a lot of things. It's going to affect the way you collect data, for example. It's going to affect your processes. When I say it's going to affect your data, um, AI works on a lot of data, and so you have to be able to collect the right type of data. 
as architects or as designers, if you had no clue about that type of data that you need to collect, then you will not be able to create potentially the right design for whatever you're designing. Does it make sense? So, um, and it affects a lot of other things. For example, it affects the, or, uh, the uh, org structure. You need some, you need, maybe you need a chief uh, AI officer. We'll talk about that later. Maybe, the, maybe some people like it, some people don't. It'll affect uh, your strategy. If Google is an AI company, they just change the strategy from a mobile first company to an AI first company. That changes the strategy. If that changes the strategy, it changes everything else in their organization. It changes culture. This culture is going to be impacted because people who are reluctant to change are going to, be, are going to have a tough time changing, and so on. So AI is going to be impactful. We have to figure out where we are on the spectrum. This is an example. You know, I talked about the insurance company earlier, but that insurance company is within that box. There are a lot of things happening outside the insurance company as well that impacts the insurance company. So when we as architects design, I think we should be even more holistic and look not only inside the enterprise, but also ex outside the enterprise. For example, in the case of insurance, um, you know, your driverless cars are going to be around the corner. I don't know how much in Europe, but, uh, you know, they're pretty talked about in the United States. So this means insurance rates are, uh, the insurance models have to change. Then there are baby boomers um, or, who are retiring. They don't want to, uh, and then the millennials are going to control the world, hold the red button. Uh, and they don't want to buy cars, perhaps. They want to rent cars, so that'll change things. Then you have climate change, whether you believe it in, in it or not, it's true. Um, you, the insurance companies have an have to consider this because if there is climate change, insurance rates should go up or should go down, that's there. So if there are many other factors that impact how this insurance company is going to work and um, in modeling inside is not enough. Modeling the outside is also um, critical. So what are big insurance companies around saying? They're saying this. We better shift. We better shift because change is happening. Um, I'll skip this one. And I want to talk, I want to um, uh, shorten it down to, you know, we talked about an insurance company, a lot of change is happening. But I want to bring it down to, so that's a billion, billion dollars or more, right? I want to bring it down to the smaller day-to-day -day activities that we talk about. And, Design and architecture and automation, automation is there everywhere. And I call this the pear, pear story. This is a picture of a pear. And it looks like a potato, but trust me, I took the picture, so it's a pear. And this pesky little thing, sticker, I don't know if you guys have it in Europe, but we have it in the United States. And this pesky little thing, it's, 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 it's not good design. When I come home, I buy this, I have to punch this thing. Uh, 4409 into the, uh, into the terminal when I check out and then I come home and I, when I peel it, I need to have, you know, I need to grow nails just for the purposes of peeling this thing. And I, I, I don't get the satisfaction of just biting into that fruit right away after I rinse it, right? So this is poor design. So design is poor, and, but there's an architectural component for, uh, for the pair as well because there's a lot that goes behind 4409 people have to agree that 4409 represents pair. Company, all, all grocery stores have to understand 4409 means pair. You can't have a mismatch. So there's architecture there. Then at the lower level of architecture, when I scan that 4409 into my, uh, into my checkout system, it'll, it'll go to a table and look up 4409 and say, okay, $1.29 to a pound today. So that's what it'll charge me. It'll put. Um, it'll charge me today, and it'll, that comes to the bill, prints it out on the bill. Tomorrow, I should be able to easily change that. So that happens, right? So there is a lot of, and then today with automation, with AI and computer vision, especially computer vision, you don't need a mechanism to scan um, the code. Computer vision systems today can look at a fruit and say it's a fruit. How many of you have seen the cat videos on uh, YouTube? 
right? You can identify systems can vision, computer vision systems can automatically identify a lot of objects. So in the future, in that third box is AI can look at the system and say, all I need to do is I need to take the pair, scan it, and it'll automatically recognize it's a pair, and that's it. I don't need this pesky label. But why it's difficult to remove this label? Because once I remove it, there are a lot of people, probably thousands of people who lose their jobs or things will change for them because they don't have the, there's no, uh, there's no sticker maker anymore. There's no organization that can bring the codes and control the codes anymore. So even making a small design change will impact a lot of stuff. So I want to say, I want to just talk about your role. We talked about the organization. What is your role? You have to identify your sweet spot in this, in this picture and uh, try to adapt. Change is happening. You need to adapt. So I'll leave you with this. The world is changing. So should you. If, and everyone has a role. So figure out your competitive advantage. And um, be hungry, be prepared, be optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, let's open up for a round of questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. That was wonderful. I love your diagrammatic explanations, the visual storytelling. I am curious, though, to stage, to initiate these kinds of conversations with stakeholders, especially those at the executive level who have so much uh, to potentially lose, right? There is the risk of that. How do you begin that conversation? Yeah, that's a tough one. But <clears throat> I think um, executives are receptive to stories. We can't, we can't throw technology at them. We can't say uh, this is what's happening. We can't just throw AI at them. We can't just throw process improvement at them. Because these are methodologies, Six Sigma. This is just a methodology. They don't really care. So if we frame the the outcomes based on stories and what impact it has on their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I'll give you some quick examples. For example, if an insurance company, for an insur or you know, it doesn't have to be an insurance company, but you take an executive and you say, how is your life going to change in the context of what's going to happen, right? The guy who runs a grocery store, tell him, okay, what if, you know, the next uh, grocery store down the line, they don't have this peeling thing. They don't have to pay for that uh, label and so on and so forth. You try to craft the story around how his or her life experience is going to change, then it clicks for them a lot of times. You know, there are some who it never clicks, but <laughs> <laughs> stories. That's why uh, one other thing is that, uh, to follow up. More than technical skills, what's uh, important in this future is uh, emotional intelligence, like we heard ye yesterday, communication, all the soft skills, the storytelling. Uh, these are the soft, soft skills that are going to be in high demand. Good morning, Raj. Morning. There, there's a really interesting dynamic in those three circles that you have there of the, the, the complementary nature of those. But there's also a tension in them because um, there is a, a huge tension between simplicity and AI which is interpretation. Um, and I think that there's a, a, a very large problem in, in many organizations that they, they get so wrapped up in collecting data, they paralyze themselves. Yes. Uh, and sure. so could you speak a little bit about this tension between simplicity and data gathering? Yes, definitely. Um, AI is a complicated subject, no doubt about it. Uh, machine learning is complex. It requires a lot of mathematics, linear algebra, and all, that st uh, and all the data. But what we as architects like to do is if we can modularize that and you know, say this is what AI provides, all you care about is the outcome to some extent, and you care about the inputs that are required to generate that outcome. That is a level of understanding that we architects need to have. We don't necessarily need to understand the models, the, all the, mo the, the details of how the AI system itself works. So, we, so sometimes they, uh, because AI, those guys, when I say AI guys, they are so in, in, into the weeds that they create solutions for problems that don't necessarily exist. They just, AI is cool, let's put it here, let's put it here. But if you step back and look at it from a business context, you have to, I think we have to say, how do I simplify the customer experience? Well, red button simplification, you know, not, not always simplification, but how do we do the red button concept? Um, and so we have to look at it from that way, but, that, but uh, not 
get into the details of this. So on one hand, you have simplicity. On the other hand, you have complexity. And uh, I think what I'm seeing in this is um, there's kind of a duality around simplicity because it's it, there is a, a customer facing simplicity as well. Yes. But when you're when you're within the enterprise, mm -hmm. that you have to consider how the simplicity can be used within the enterprise for making decisions. Yes. And so that, that simplicity has a very interesting duality to it. Definitely. Because we can't simplify. The things are complex. There are a lot of things that are complex. And you can't just make it simple. But uh, so I don't say, you know, take everything and simplify. Can we hide the complexity? Can that, high, uh, the, can that ca complexity be delegated to the people who understand that complexity? Let them deal with it. And maybe it is architects. Sometimes it's architects. We as architects have to understand this uh, complexity, yet we have to simplify to the end consumer, the, the, the pair. I don't care whether the code is translated, how the code is translated, how it's scanned, and so on and so forth, right, as a consumer. But as an architect, I do. I do know, need to know all the complexity so that I can try to jump between the two. I hope that answers. Thank you. Hey, Raj. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we take the three circles and there's the sweet spot in the middle. What do you think people will call themselves that are in that sweet spot? That's a good question. Now, I think what happens is most of the people start n in one place. As designers, if you start as a designer, the co some of the conversations I have yesterday with some people is that, OK, what after design? What do you do after design? So they might say, architecture is a natural thing to jump to. Uh, I came from kind of architecture. I came from the AI side, actually. Uh, but archite after architecture, I said, architecture is not good enough, as you saw in that example. right? I jumped to design because I said, design is fascinating because of the red button thing. There's so much to be done with design. When you, when you Milan, you talked yesterday about, do we actually, with design, do we so solve world problems? We do, because if in that traffic light situation, if I can uh, help you know, a million people, New York, I guess, and a million people will be crossing the roads, if I can meet, m help a million people feel in control of the situation, that's great. So we designers help. Uh, and, and so I think it, it's kind of you, j you jump between the three. At least I've given you the, the place where you, can, you, you know where to jump, hopefully. OK, thanks. Thank you so much, Raj. Thank you. Thanks very much.